Japan is changing. A rapidly aging society, a record-breaking influx of visitors from overseas, and more robots than ever. That's where the country's young people come in. Gen J, a new series by BBC Work Life, keeps you up to speed on how the nation's next generation is shaping the Japan of tomorrow. At a sleek office building in Shinagawa, Tokyo, workers are strolling in and out for lunch. As they walk through the glass doors, they pass two security guards, each dutifully flanking the passage in stern silence. It all seems pretty unremarkable until you realize one of those security guards is a robot. A new generation of female humanoid robots has just been revealed. These advanced androids are designed to look and act like real women, complete with lifelike skin and hair. While they may appear harmless at first glance, these robots are designed for one thing and one thing only, to serve humans. Whether it's providing companionship or carrying out tasks, these robots are eerily lifelike and disturbingly servile. Imagine you are talking to a customer service agent. Obviously, you assumed that this agent is a human being. Well, your assumption might be wrong. You could be talking to Nadine, who is the most humanoid robot in the world. And you could be forgiven for thinking that Nadine is a human, as she has a human-looking body with lifelike features. She can even recognize you from previous visits, make eye contact, shake your hand, continue chatting based on previous meetings, etc. Nadine was developed by Kokoro Japan, with her software platform developed at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She is currently working as a customer service agent at the AIA Singapore, an insurance company. Nadine is a socially intelligent robot who is friendly, greets you back, makes eye contact, and remembers all the nice chats you had with her. She's able to answer questions in several languages, show emotions both in her gestures and in her face depending on the content of the interaction with the user. Nadine can recognize people she has previously met and engage in flowing conversation. Nadine is also fitted with a personality, meaning her mood can sour depending on what you say to her. Nadine has a total of 27 degrees of freedom DOF, for facial expressions and upper body movements. She can recognize anybody she has met and remembers facts and events related to each person. Nadine is the ideal companion when nobody is there. She can assist people with special needs, read stories, show images, put on Skype sessions, send emails, and communicate with the family. She is part of the human-assistive new technology which is badly needed as society cannot afford a full-time social worker for each person with special needs. She can play the role of a personal, private coach, always available when nobody is there. Nadine was developed using cutting-edge robotics technology to simulate human behavior. She has 3D depth cameras, a microphone, and a webcam to gather visual and audio inputs. Then, there are various perception layers that process these inputs to recognize different faces, gestures, emotions, behavior, etc., and then respond accordingly. Nadine also had inbuilt chatbots that allowed her to handle different queries and a memory model that remembers different users and conversations with them. In addition to all this, Nadine can also converse in six languages, namely English, German, French, Chinese, Hindi, and Japanese. Japanese, so you won't have any problems talking to her. Also, when you watch the news, you get to know the latest updates from the news anchor. But now, that news anchor might be a robot. If you are in Japan, you might be getting your daily news from Erika, a Japanese robot. Erika was created by Hiroshi Ishiguro, the director of the Intelligent Robotics Laboratory at Osaka University. She is one of the most intelligent humanoids developed in Japan with a special emphasis on her speech capabilities. And while Erika cannot walk, she can easily interact with human beings and change her facial expressions according to the conversation. This is possible for Erika because of the 15 inbuilt infrared sensors in her eyes that can track any movement. She also has speech generation algorithms and facial recognition recognition technology that makes it easy to track different faces in a room. Erica has inbuilt 44 degrees of freedom that allows her to face, neck, waist, and exhibit various facial expressions. And while she is unable to move her arms yet, it is not that big of a problem, as she is working as a news anchor. Also, Hiroshi Ishigiru seems to think Erika has a soul, but that is a question that creates a debate more on robotic metaphysics and less on technology. Erika is part of a five-year research project to build a talking friend for an aging, shrinking population in Japan. In Japan, many are living alone, and they need to have a conversation with others, says Takashi Minato, a researcher with Hiroshi Ishigiru Laboratories. The human-like robots can help support them. The robot revolution is active worldwide. In the US, companies are looking to robots to replace me menial labor in the coming years. Electronics manufacturers showed various degrees of robots at the CES trade show last month that, for the most part, basically bring a set of digital eyes and smiles 
to smart connected speakers like the Amazon Echo and Google Home. But for the cutting edge, when it comes to robot companions, Japan is the place to be. Asian researchers are among the leaders in the pursuit of building humanoids, and in Japan, robots are revered. There's a hotel near Tokyo that attracts visitors by having robots check in guests, a popular robot restaurant featuring a show of battling transformer types, and many cartoons, comic books, and movies featuring friendly or heroic robots like Astro Boy. The Japanese believe that Westerners view robots with great suspicion as job killers or dehumanizing machines. If in Western pop culture the image of the Terminator robot is pervasive, then in Japan the image is of a robot as a savior. After the destruction of World War II, recovery and rebuilding the nation were heavily tied to modern technology and robotics. In post-war Japan, robots came to be depicted as human-like, kind, friendly superheroes. The robot savior became embedded in the culture and began with the hero prototype Astro Boy. Astro Boy was created in 1951, when Japan was recovering from the war's nuclear tragedy. His creator was Usamu Tezuka, a physician and illustrator, which I especially love because my father, David Lobel, is also a physician and an illustrator. Tezuka said he wanted to create a creature that was opposite of Pinocchio, a boy who becomes a thing as opposed to a thing that becomes a real boy. The story by now should sound familiar to you. Like Pinocchio, Astro Boy's story was retold in various mediums and animations adaptations. Professor Tenma, the head of the Ministry of Science, is obsessed with creating a human-like robot while being a neglectful father to his own son, Tobio. Tobio runs away and is killed in a car accident, and in his grief, Tenma creates Astro Boy in the image of his late son. Astro Boy becomes a superhero, using his powers to bring about good in society. He has a superpower of detecting whether a person is good or evil, and he fights aliens and robots gone bad. He also fights robot haters such as the Black Lux, a group of humans that are on a mission to exterminate all robots. In one story, Astro protects Vietnamese against the US Air Force, traveling back in time to 1969 and preventing the bombing of Vietnamese villages. Astro Boy captured the imagination and fueled visions of what robotics could become. Many Japanese roboticists have a representation of Astro Boy in their office space, a framed photo of him hanging prominently in their lab or a figurine on their desk. The curse of Astro Boy, according to Japanese scholars, is the gap between what cartoon anime can do and what robots on the market cannot yet do, a constant disappointment to Japanese consumers. The mindset that machines are caring and giving continues to this day in Japan. No doubt any sweeping generalization about cultural differences will be just that, a sweeping generalization, but there has certainly been a longer focus in Japan on a robot revolution and the growth of AI in all dimensions of life, while American AI has focused first on military and marketing purposes. One Japanese robotics professor describes his dream of assigning robots to babies at the time of birth. The assigned robot will grow and walk with the person throughout their life, acting as a caretaker, a friend, a bodyguard, and a historian. The robot will record and memorize everything that the person experiences and will continue to care for them literally from cradle to grave. They would be lifelong companions. In philosophical terms, sometimes referred to as the zombie puzzle, does it matter if we are benefiting emotionally from interactions with something that looks and feels and sounds exactly like a human but does not have a consciousness? Does it matter to us humans whether the other side is feeling or just mimicking feelings? If it works, if people feel happier when they interact with Paro, does it matter that it isn't a real animal? The crisis of the elderly is very real and acute. By 2055, nearly 40% of Japan's population will be elderly. Women live longer than men and thereby are more likely to suffer from the physical and emotional challenges of aging, including loneliness, dementia, social isolation, and immobility. Women are also the primary caretakers of elderly family members. Our systems of value do not have to compete with one another. Robots can enhance our ability to recognize and support empathy, which would then result in better integration of elder care. The social integration of robots and the valuing of human care can be mutually reinforcing as society navigates the realities of the future.